miles long at its widest point, about 60, 70 miles wide, completely surrounded by mountains, going from 10 to 14,000 feet high. It's like a perfect Petri dish. If I was a scientist and I wanted a, a sociological, geographically you know, based Petri dish, this would be the perfect Petri dish to look at the societal um, response and interaction with something, you know, high, potentially high strange. So when I started out, I was, you know, just a, a reporter for a small town newspaper. Um, I lived in a little town of Crestone. There was about 200 people. We published a monthly newspaper called the Crestone Eagle. I had a a really cool, uh, you know, New Year's Eve party on December 31st, uh, 1992. And as I was circulating through the party, I saw little groups of people talking about a particular UFO sighting, which, as I found out, circulating through the, the party, they were talking about the same event, apparently. So... I figured this was a great article for my little, you know, small town newspaper. And I interviewed everybody and I had two weeks, um, you know, lead time until I had to turn the article in. So I started to research some of the unexplained events that had occurred in the world's largest Alpine Valley. (laughs) And I knew probably about a week in that if I wanted to, I had a whole book worth of stuff, probably more than one book. And uh, I was off to the races. I've uncovered incredible stuff uh, from Native American legends, cryptozoological stuff, uh, metaphysical... The the Crestone area, (laughs) or the Baca Grande, where I lived, probably has the highest concentration of ancient unbroken spiritual lineages represented in healing centers, uh, ashrams, monasteries, than any other place on the planet. Most people don't know this. They don't realize that five sects of Tibetan Buddhists, um, a Zen you know, monastery, a Carmelite Christian monastery, you know, uh, Shimmy Shimakai, Subu, I mean, the the list goes on and on. All these organizations have a presence in this little town that I kind of accidentally moved to. And, uh, you know, I know I'm sort of digressing, but I really feel, Alex, that there are certain places on the planet that are like drains. They're spiritual drains or they're... They're like cannons, and you can call them hotspot areas, vortexes, window areas, gateway areas, um, strange locations, whatever. I've identified a number of these in North America. I think the San Luis Valley is a classic textbook example of an area that attracts certain kinds of esoteric, metaphysic, um, paranormal, whatever term you want to apply to it. You, you, you remember the J.J. Uh, J. Abrams show Lost? Remember yes. Remember island? Well, the San Luis Valley is, you know, in a, a more of a mundane, realistic kind of sober way, is an example of a location that has unusual geophysical properties, a history of unexplained events, a tradition of sacredness with the indigenous people, and intense interest by the military-industrial complex. Those five things, if you put them together, you have a hotspot region. The San Luis Valley is a, a boilerplate textbook example of one of these types of regions. And there are many of them around the world and in North America. But the San Luis Valley is one that has a documented history of unusual events that I've been able, standing on the shoulder of giants, uh, it's not only me, I've been working with people that have been going there for decades. You know, this is a place that we may have 
how would I put this? An insider kind of sort of shortcut view of what a hotspot portal area is on the planet. I rest my case. There is something going on here that it's it's difficult to put the finger on why exactly the government is here. Uh, the, the, the basis you mentioned. You know what it is? You know what it is, Alex? You're there. Go outside, take a deep breath, and still your mind. I've been all over. Uh, I've, I've visited hotspot areas all over North America. I've visited, you know, down to Chiapas, to Palenque, and Dishbiltoon, and Yachatlan, and other places. It's the quality of silence. It, the silence in the San Luis Valley roars. It is loud. It just screams at you. And if you just slightly tune into it as an outsider coming in, it'll blow your mind. My mind already is blown, and it definitely is a place where you can reach that quiet place inside that at times is very difficult around cell phone towers and Babylon, if you will. Our guest today is Christopher O'Brien, author of The Mysterious Valley in the Valley and Stalking the Trickster. Welcome back. We're going to be uh, taking of any questions for our guest tonight, Christopher O'Brien, author of The Mysterious Valley, Inner the Valley, and Stalking the Trickster, at 218-339-8525. Chris, one of the things that I've learned from your research is that this was also an area where Indian warriors would go for their vision quests. Uh, tell us a little bit more about some of the tribes in the that originally resided in this region and um, some of the information you've come across through your interactions with um, some of the native people? Well, first of all, no tribes actually inhabited the San Luis Valley. The closest you could come to that would be the Ute Indians who were nomadic, who would pass through. But in terms of, you know, actually living there full time, uh, what, two and a half weeks ago, I think I saw that it was 44 degrees below zero. Um, you got to have some pretty stout moccasins and, a, I don't know, sort of a space blanket <laughs> teepee, uh, to live there in the, in the wintertime. However, the San Luis Valley, again, the world's largest alpine valley, was peacefully co-inhabited during the summer months by 13 different Indian tribes that represented Indians from three different regional groups. In other words, the only place in North America where three regional groups of Indians overlapped is in the San Luis Valley. Um, 13 tribes uh, come to mind from the Plains Indians, the you know, Lakota, Dakota, the Mandan, the Arapaho, um, the Cree, the Blackfoot, they would come down into the valley, the Great Basin Indians, the Paiute, the Ute, uh, most spe spe specific, whatever that word is, um, they are probably the most, um, I don't know, um, they're the ones that really kind of live there, if you could say that. The other Indians came and visited. But all the Pueblo Indians, you know, from the uh, Hopi, the Zuni, all the northern Pueblos, Pewaukee to Seki, all the way up to the Tewa in Taos, they would come up in the San Luis Valley, do vision quests. They say good uh, work in hunting. Um, also... Uh, as you mentioned before, the Navajo, the the Apache, who are the Diné uh, people, they also would overlap with all these other Indians. And prior to the Spanish arrival in the 1500s, it was a fairly peaceful place. And then 
with the interjection of the European, um, you know, thrust up the, up the Rio Grande, Onate and um, Dianza later on in the 1700s, they were the ones that kind of came up and, and did an incursion of European influence into the valley. And that, of course, created political turmoil. Indians started to fight against Indians, uh, siding with the Spanish. The Americans came in later, Kit Carson for Massachusetts, uh, you know, in the mid-1800s. It gets into a whole sort of political mishmash of of who's actually in charge of the valley. But for a thousand years, three regional groups of Indians, 13 different tribes from the Great Basin, the Plains, and the Southwest, all peacefully co-inhabited the San Luis Valley. And it's really interesting as a researcher to dive into the, you know, historical sort of tradition, which is all obviously based on an oral tradition. It's kind of like archaeologists or, or rather anthropologists coming in, sociologists, and, and trying to figure out who these people are and, and why they hold the place sacred. It, it was like one of those blank areas on the map. The Spanish came up to Rio Grande in the 1500s. They got up to Taos, which is at the extreme southern end of the valley. And then for 200 years, they refused to go north up into the valley because that's where, you know, the boogeyman lived. That You don't go up there. And, and so for 200 years, Europeans wouldn't go up into the valley. And the first real bona fide documented incursion into the San Luis Valley was in 1777 by Juan Batista de Anza, who was the um, governor of the New Mexico Territory. He went up there chasing a Comanche chief named Cuena Verde. And as he camped along the base of Blanca Peak, which is the end of the, uh, a spur of the Sangre de Cristo Mountains, the seventh highest mountain in Colorado, 1,400, you know, 14,200 feet. As they were camped there, they heard these strange kind of rumblings in the ground, sort of a, a weird moaning or or low-pitched uh, tone. And at the same time, they witnessed weird lights that seemed to be dancing around the peaks of, of Blanca, Little, Little Bear, uh, Mount Taylor, Mount Humphreys, Colorado uh, uh, Peak, you know, the highest mountains of that particular part of the Sangres. And my database, which I, I'm very proud of, um, starts off with this particular diary entry by Dianza. So the uh, the Spanish and others uh, I've read from your books, they were initially coming in the area in search of gold? Initially, yeah. Actually, the French were there before. Um, the French were the, the first ones to actually discover gold in the 1700s. The Spanish came up. They stopped you know, in Taos at the Taos Pueblo. And officially, they wouldn't go north from there. But unofficially, obviously, you know, prospectors and treasure hunters were going up north into the valley. And, um, you know, I have a whole chapter in my second book, Enter the Valley, which talks about some of these, um, you know, undocumented incursions up into the valley where gold was supposedly discovered. But... We do know that the Summitville Gold Site, which is now a super fun site um, for all you environmentalists, that's where gold we know was, was actually discovered. And the French in the 1760s, 1770s um, were responsible for, you know, exploiting the gold there. And unfortunately... <laughs> I have a whole, like I said, chapter on treasure legends. Um, unfortunately, all the gold, which, quote-unquote, was 200 mules worth of gold ore, was then unable to be taken out of the valley because the Ute Indians came and massacred the miners and the the French, um, you know, guardians of the mining expedition. And 
um, of j- there were just two actually survivors 